Um, and so it's clear we need a new commitment. Um, and I think we as stakeholders need to act collectively through a global led agenda um, to give you momentum and push uh, to efforts on climate change and security. The BGGTs continue to play a central role in this agenda, but they need to be part of a, of a much broader concerted effort. Because uh, by themselves, they're not enough to bring about the structural change which we're aspiring to. But second, we need to better integrate the BGGTs and we should lend tenure into the broader development efforts, paradigms, and narratives. And then tenure is central to natural resource management, biodiversity conservation, addressing climate change, but it's not at the center of the discussion here. It's also central to equitable and sustainable process to transformation. Again, it's not at the center of the discussion where, where it should be. And so I think what this requires really is for us to reaffirm our political will and support for, for these processes. Uh, it was started in two, uh, 2014 in Dakar, in Senegal, with the aim of ensuring a continued and organized civil society engagement in support of the implementation of the AU Declaration of Land. First. Second, it aimed at strengthening the voice of the marginalized. And three, it aimed at advocating for issues of women's land rights to be accommodated in national land policy processes. The CSP was established with support from the Land Policy Initiative. The Land Policy Initiative, which is known now as the African Land Policy Center, which was established with a view to translate the commitments of the African heads of states into concrete action. With support from ILC, thanks very much for us, UN Habitat GLTN, Welt Hunger Hilfe, the CSP conducted the assessment to take stock of what what progress has been made since it was adopted more than a decade ago. Two, what lessons could we learn from the whole process? And three, to put forward recommendations including key areas for further improvement of land governance. The overall objective of the study is to monitor the effectiveness of the commitments of African heads of states and government in the field of land policy development, implementation, and monitoring in Africa. Specific objectives, Okay. Specific objectives include to map key initiatives run by AU state members, economic communities, and other AU bodies like the NEPA, to assess progress achieved in key commitments, including the AU call to member states to reach for the targets of 30% registered land 
owned by women by 2025. Three, identify and analyze the technical and institutional hurdles, constraints that the country's directs may be running into. And four, provide information on how local communities, including women and youth, perceive improvements in land governance and land tenure security over the last decade. The scope of the study, 13 African countries, seven regional economic bodies, were the core of the, uh, the scope of the study. The key findings now, one, the ALBC has to a large extent lived up to its mission. A greater awareness on the need for developing national land policies prepared, and this is important, in a participatory manner. Three, a higher profile of land reforms and governance in Africa. Four, an increased number of member states have engaged in land policy formulation leading to a significant number of countries among the AU members who have launched or started to work to prepare their national policy document. The FAO presentation has just given some examples. Land issues are today high on the agenda of the AU. Now, the ALPC has been able to ensure that for each African Union meeting, there is an assessment, the reporting that is done by the national countries, but also by the ranks. The ALPC responded very swiftly to some critical issues like the search that we had in LSNBIs. And they went even beyond that and came up with an action plan on how do you deal with LSNBIs. ALPC, uh, oh, I skipped one. Uh, the considerable attention is now given to women's land rights, particularly after they adopted the 30% uh, commitment. ALPC initiated the network of excellence on land governance in Africa, the NELGA. This is one of the key things that the head of states committed to, to develop capacity on how to manage land. Uh, land issues and land governance. More space and voice have been given to key non-state stakeholders that are typically marginalized in land and natural resource governance. Today, debates with CSO, women's organization, family organization, youth organization are common things in many African countries now. And then a wide range of actors are now contributing to the implementation of the AU agenda on land. Challenges. Persisting land challenges relate to one, securing women's land rights. Two, Securing communal land rights, <laughs> putting in place a unified land administration 
and data gathering system. Most of our countries are still encountering a lot of problems working on this data. So this is something that right, we have an expert in the room who can tell us more about. Addressing the continued investor pressure on land in Africa is one of the key challenges that we are facing ahead. The continued need for redistributive reforms and finally the need to make adequate financial resources available, especially in the form of dedicated national government budget provisions. Most of our efforts in land governance are still donor dependent. Key areas now, the researchers thought they we would want to focus on when going forward. One had been AU member states to translate adopted land policies into specific laws and regulation, followed by piloting and generalizing generalization of the implementation on the ground. We would need human resources, we would need expertise. This is one of the critical areas where we believe it is important if we want full and effective implementation, we need to focus on those. Two, tracking progress in land policy development and implementation through full operationalization of the monitoring and evaluation of land policy in Africa. This is the MELA project. Three, strengthening land governance capacity of, of national government and the regional economic communities with the view of strengthening exchange of experiences and lesson learning on land governance among member states. Four, ensuring adequate financing of land policy formulation processes and more importantly, establishing effective land administration systems. This requires government adequate budget commitments, the establishment of effective revenue generation land taxation system, and also continued financial support from donor partners. Maintaining and strengthening the contribution of civil society organizations. Two, efforts to promote the AU agenda on land through awareness raising, dialogue, advocacy, monitoring, experience sharing. Protecting and securing land rights of low income and marginalized urban dwellers. Some of the emerging challenges relate to rapid population growth, the large youth population, rising land inequality and landlessness, as well as changes in technology. This is what has transpired in the report, which I would want now with your permission to call on others. Is Mino in the room as well? Otherwise, not love. Mo, please, can the two of you come so that we do the official launch of this report? Here, Mo. Just while they are opening the presentation, um, we're changing levels. With my presentation, we're going to, to local level, we're going to practice level. So the first two presentations have, have 
presented the state and done an assessment of the progress made in the framework of these global and regional frameworks. And they focused on the global regional, and as both presentations did with examples at national level. But we remained really at the level of policy. The second, the third presentation, sorry, my presentation, will trickle down, decentralize, and go to the level of practice, the level, uh, the local levels, the levels that at the end we want to see change. These are the levels that, that we do all this work for, right? It's for the change at local level, the change in tenure, the change of the lives of those who live on and from the land. So we assessed, uh, we, we published last week actually, um, a report uh, of the land matrix entitled Little Progress in Practice. And what we did here is we used the data of the land matrix, we used the VGT as the umbrella framework to really assess over the last 10 years what has happened with regards to large scale land investment, what has happened with regards to the practices of investors uh, in land. So, very quickly, land matrix, I think all of you know it, we track uh, large scale land acquisitions worldwide. We focus on, on, on the continents in the south. We do this since 2012 uh, for documenting uh, these transactions for more transparency and, and lately also for more accountability. Accountability of states, accountability of, um, of investors. We follow about four or five thousand uh, acquisitions worldwide, of which 50% are in Africa. You can access all the data on landmatrix.org. I think most of you have, um, have done that. As I said, we have these global frameworks this is not an evaluation of these global frameworks, but we take these global framework as, as the framework for, for developing these evaluations of practices and changing on the ground. So the point of departure here is we acknowledge the progress made, the necessary progress made through these frameworks. These are necessary to set the scene at global level, to trickle down at policy level, at national level, as, as Ben and, and Kanute have um, Amadou have presented. But now, what has this done? What has happened? What was the translation of these policies at practice and, and local level? So how did we do this? Very simply, we took the VGT's frameworks, which is organized in chapters and articles. There's about 10, 12 chapters, I think, on, 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 on the really um, the technical parts of land tenure, with each one a certain number of articles. We've aligned that with the variables of the land matrix. So we identified the variables of the land matrix that could feed in on the different thematics covered by these articles and chapters of the VGTs. As you know, the VGTs are, are quite convoluted are quite um, broad. Each article is, is not one point, it's often two, three, four, five points, very complex. So often we had to deal with one, two, three, five variables of the land matrix feeding information per article. So at the end, we aggregated the various variables to get a score for each of the articles, or we used various, var various variables of the land matrix feeding various articles of the VGTs. And at the end, we just aggregated and took an average. Three points before going to the, to the results. First of all, the VGTs are broad and cover all aspects of, of land governance. The land matrix only covers one aspect, which is large-scale land investment. So we cover only a very small part here in this report of the VGTs. Secondly, we did it only for Africa up till now. We are at this stage, and I see several of our um, uh, colleagues here, doing the same exercise for Asia and Latin America. And we hope for, for the 10th the anniversary of the VGT event, which will happen at the CFS in October, to have three regional reports and a global report um, uh, to be launched. And third point, again, I re-emphasize that, it's not an it looks only on large scale land acquisitions, and we use it as an umbrella to guide the evaluation and the assessments we do of the practices here. 
we have to be very cautious with the data we present and <clears throat> not to be biased in any way and to, to present the most solid results. It's a very sensitive topic. We are pinpointing here on, on, on investors, or investors, on practice of investors. So the first thing is we did we assess the quality of the data through a retention test. So deals where we did not have enough information, or countries where there was not enough information, or countries where there was not enough of deals were taken out of the assessment. Otherwise, one or two data points would have biased the entire exercise. Through this retention test, we retained 23 countries to do the on which we did the assessment, including about 730 land deals. Coming to the results now. They are dire. They are not good at all. When we applied the retention test and then did this assessment on the 23 countries, we saw that about 78% of the deals in Africa, the large-scale acquisition deals in Africa, show an unsatisfactory compliance with regard to the VGT implementation. What do we call unsatisfactory? Is they reach a level of 50%. This is a very low threshold, because we could have said we take a threshold of 100% that implementation of all the, 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 the related VGT articles, which I think would be would be a legitimate threshold um, because not respecting uh, indigenous people's right of any of the articles would already be a breach of the of the VGTs. But we didn't do that; otherwise, we would have a scores of zero everywhere. Uh, we put the threshold of fifty percent and qualified that as satisfactory or unsatisfactory. So applying that, we see that seventy-eight percent of the deals do not uh, have a satisfactory level of compliance of the VGTs. When we aggregate that, no, sorry, and actually 20% of these deals do not comply with the VGTs at all, with any of the articles that were included in, in, the, in the evaluation. When we aggregate that at country level, it's about 87% of these 23, so at African level, that uh, do not have a satisfactory level of compliance with the as I said, very dire situations, and when I presented that, including to some of the colleagues who were in FAO, et cetera, they said, we were expecting that. It's good we can put a figure on it, but we know that trick this trickle down, that the results have been having a policy level never trickled down, or not yet as much to practice level and, 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 and local level, and that the activities of, of investors in this case uh, are still to be, to, to, to be reached, or to, to be changed. The least performing thematic, so now we're going to the articles themselves, were, were threefold. First of all, the consultative processes. So the implementation of FPIC is very, very low in the case, in the case of, of Africa. And let me quickly hear um, what the score is of this. Uh, 26.5% of the deals only apply uh, in their consultation processes and attain uh, ethnic um, regards to implementation. The second thematic that is uh, not complied with is responsible and inclusive investment and respect of national law and legislation. So national law, investment law, but also land law uh, and law in general not being respected in the countries. And the third one is respect of legitimate tenure rights and especially uh, informal tenure rights of local communities and indigenous peoples. Um, the report then goes into each of these articles and each of these chapters. And I don't have time to, to go in each of them, um, as there is about 10 or 12, not all on investment, but many of them have elements of investment in there. I'll take an example here on investments, which is uh, the lowest score uh, in general, 26.6. And so what we see here that is in, more, in most of the deals, in most of the large scale land acquisition, there's a limited presence of inclusive development models and of a lack, and lack of robust consultations, as I mentioned uh, already before. You can, of course, then disaggregate results according to the chapters and have more precise elements uh, of response according to these different variables that define uh, the investment chapter in the, in, in the VGTs. One transversal element or, or co 
conclusion or observation we can draw from, from this work is about information of data. After 10 years of EGTs, after 10 years of, of global and regional frameworks, after more than 10 years of data initiatives like the land matrix being implemented, we still deal with a lack of information on these large-scale land acquisition. Actually, for this report, we developed the transparency index. And these are the number of data points we have uh, for the variables included in, in this assessment. And for most of the deals and most of the countries, we have a transparency score of 5 to 20%. That means that for all of these investments, we have only 5 up to 20% of information needed for this assessment. It means that transparency remains dire, information is not available, even after all these efforts in global frameworks and all the efforts of transparency. Just to conclude, my time is over. We have presented three recommendations in the report. As I said, this is only the first report of, of three, and we would also like to develop a global one. So the emphasis here was not on the recommendations and, 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 the, and, and the policy uh, policy observations and then that can come out of it. We will do this with the global report more in depth. But still, three observations, three recommendations quickly you could quickly be formed. The first one is to continue fast track land reform. And Ben showed it very well. This the ten years is only a first step towards towards the second phase. We need to push all of us for more rapid transformation, for more rapid land reform in, at country level. When I say rapid, it, is, it doesn't have to be done rapidly, but at least to engage these processes so that we effectively start translating the policy progresses that we've seen at global and national level uh, in, in, in practice, in, in, in really implementation measures uh, on the ground. Secondly, Corporate and investor country accountability. There's more mechanisms to be developed uh, at that level. And we've seen progress made by the European Commission that just uh, published their directives on, on due diligence in global value chains, but they're still to be implemented, and there's a lot of shortcomings in there as well uh, at different levels. So more to be done there, but there's pressure to be made on the private sector uh, through instruments uh, like these directives. And then lastly, it's a big chunk of, of work has been done, but a lot has to be done still on transparency and, and, and information out there. By making it compulsory at public, at public and, and, and private level, but also through monitoring initiatives like these and, and how information systems like this, which are complementary to, to more formal systems, can be can be embedded in policy and, and, and uh, investment processes. I'll thank you.